we are going to witness a prestigious event during the CME, that is uh, Professor Emil Dettin Memorial Endowment Lecture. Uh, we would like to request Professor Dayanda Babu to introduce the Endowment Lecture. Professor Emil Dettin was my close friend. His full name was Yam Leela Dharadathan. He was from my native place and he was uh, just one year senior to me in the school and also in Triangle Medical College. After that, he took his uh, MS from Triangle Medical College and then he went to UK and took his first years. After coming back, he joined Trichur Medical College as assistant professor. Later on, he was promoted as associate and professor of surgery and later on HOD in Trichur Medical College. His area of interest was mainly stomach, especially carcinoma stomach. He did a uh, few original uh, work in carcinoma stomach in Trichur Medical College. After retirement from Trichur Medical College, he joined the Jubilee Medical Mission Hospital and he was working there and he passed away during that period. Uh, he was very active in the Association of Surgeons of India. He was the uh, Joint Secretary, later on Secretary and then Chairman of VSA Kerala chapter and he has contributed a lot to the Association of Surgeons of India Kerala chapter and he did the prestigious Raghavajari oration also. Uh, in memory of uh, Amal Dattan, Lilathar Dattan, this uh, uh, endowment lecture is instituted and I'm sure this time it is being done by Professor P. Rajan. That's so, all. Thank you. Can we have Professor Rajan to be seated? I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome uh, esteemed uh, Madam Dr. Uh, Shobha Dutta, Sudha Dutta Ma'am, wife of uh, H. Sri uh, Dr. Emil Dutta, sir. She retired as Professor of Pathology in uh, GMC Tichu. After which she has work, worked in Amala Medical College and Jubilee Mission Medical College as uh, Professor of Pathology. Um, uh, we are extremely thank, uh, grateful that uh, you could make it for this uh, prestigious function which we are holding in memory of uh, Professor Dutta. Dr. P. Rajan, PR, completed his MBBS from Calicut Medical College in 1972 and procured the gold medal for best outgoing student along with many other gold medals in anatomy, pathology and surgery. He completed his post-graduation from the same institution with university gold medal in surgery. He also did fellowship in surgery from Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, Glasgow, in the year 1986. Dr. P. Rajan worked as a faculty in Medical College Service and retired from Medical, <coughs> Medical College in 2005. He was posted as Emeritus Professor of Surgery at Calicut in the year 2005 by, by the government. Dr. P. Rajan had served the NIC Kerala chapter as the Honorary Secretary from 91 to 93. <coughs> Presently, he is serving Association of Surgeons of India as the Governing Council member from 2018 onwards. He was awarded the prestigious Professor Raghavajari Oration in 2005, <coughs> Dr. Mohandas Memorial Oration in 2008, and Susruda Award in 2010. <coughs> Dr. P. Rajan had been an examiner for undergraduates 
and postgraduate students in various universities and national board of examination in surgery. He had guided many postgraduate students in his long teaching career and mentored many in the art of craft of surgery. He has two international presentations and a number of national, state and zonal presentations. Apart from his surgical career, he had been the Calicut University cricket team captain in 1971 and Kerala North Zone cricket, cricket team captain in 1972. After this illustrious career in the government service, he is now continuing as a senior consultant in surgery at Astor Mims Calicut. I have immense pressure in presenting Dr. P. Rajan, who has been aptly chosen to deliver the Dr. M. L. Dutton Memorial Endowment Lecture on the topic the surgery we visited during the annual CME at P.K. Das Institute of Medical Science today. It will be an immense pleasure to request uh, Professor Rajan to deliver the Dr. M. L. Dutton Endowment Lecture. Good morning, senior colleagues, delegates, my friends. Thank you very much, the Association of Surgeons of India, Kerala Chapter, in giving me the privilege to deliver this prestigious operation. Much had been talked about Dr. Gihadar Dattan. I had my first acquaintance with Professor Dattan at Calicut Medical College where he joined as tutoring surgery for the first time under Professor B.T. Nair, sir. Uh, we lost touch in between, but then later, when I was transferred to Trichur, he was holding the second unit, and I was holding the fourth unit in Trichur Medical College, where I could find that he was one of the most wanted surgeon, excellent teacher. Trichur Medical College Surgery Department, as I'm sure Dr. Kulas is sitting here, was a very small room. The department and room was very small, but the commentary was terrific, fantastic. In fact, the best thing I remember is Kulas remi reminding me at 1.30, the Parishalam Express is due for me to return back to Calicut. Thank you, Sudha Madam, for being here for this occasion. Let me start uh, by uh, writing my tributes to the, my alma mater. We have a lot of colorful photographs of Calicut Medical College. But as the, as the topic is that I'm, I'm retreating my steps back, this is a time when I joined Calicut Medical College, 1967. This college has made me what I am today. I have paid my rich tributes to my teachers, my students, and above all, the patients who has made me what I am today. <coughs> Surgeons, uh, by and large, have to be very humble because you are proven wrong or right. You can be ecstatic when you are right, but you are a little saddened when you are wrong, thrown on the table. There's a very nice small uh, poem, I wouldn't say poem. Surgeons, beware when you wield your knife, for beneath it appears something called life. So the knife is our weapon, by and large. Still, we have to be very careful when we wield this particular knife to safeguard the interests of the patient and to protect his life. <clears throat> Nemesis is the goddess of vengeance, divine justice and vengeance. Her anger is directed towards the human transgression of the natural the right order of things and the arrogance causing it. Nemesis pursues the insolent and wicked with inflexible vengeance. So anything we do wrong, I'm sure you can expect. Whether it's a myth or not, the conscience will be hurt, definitely. My talk is based on 
a book which I have read, written by Harold Ellis, <coughs> the father of NHS in the UK. He's a prolific writer. He's written a wonderful book on history of surgery. The third edition has just come, and this was presented to me no <coughs> other than by Ram Dr. Dilip Dada. Dilip keeps on presenting me books related to surgery. He gave me a book on John Hunter. He gave me this book. Well, Harold Ellis goes back down to the, the early age, the medieval age, the modern age of surgery. How it developed, where are we leading to? So this has been an inspiration for me to, to arrange uh, or prepare this particular talk. I'll be revisiting sometimes some of those baseless surgeries. You may call it baseless surgeries. At, at that point of time, perhaps that was the in thing. Second surgery is that went into oblivion. And I will pay respects at revisiting a few of my teachers whose simple ways of teaching had led a long way in my career. And definitely I'll wind up by saying something about random thoughts on medicine, so it is developing. Some of the baseless surgeries we may call it now. It was performed by this gentleman. Sir William Arbuthnot Lane. He was knighted by the Queen, so you can imagine how powerful he was or how, how important a person he was in UK or England at that point of time. He used to perform collectomies, total collectomies, for a condition what is known as chronic fatigue syndrome. And his thesis was that all noxious substances are produced in the colon and removing the colon will make you all right. And at that point of time, in fact, in London, people were happy that colons were removed. And when you go on a social dinner, you say that your colon is removed? Oh no, you're not good. That was the sort of situation that happened in, at that point of time. Uh, people used to say that Collie, chloroform was uh, very, very affectionately called as Collie. Chloroform has done a lot of mystic, because before the time of anesthesia, Surgery was a lot difficult. You have to do in quick time, as every one of us must have heard about Robert Lister, who used to finish up an amputation in two minutes, three minutes time. People have to be held down or given whiskey or, or one of the inebriating agents to make sure that they sleep off. And it has to be very quick. But in chloroform, it was a starting point of anesthesia. Before, of course, local anesthetics were used. Cocaine leaves were chewed by the aborigines, spat on the wound to make it anesthetic. That was the whole time story that Harold Ellis talked about. But in the modern medicine, we talk about chloroform, it's normally used. But then people were put to sleep so that the surgeon could take his own sweet time to do no screaming, no nothing of the sort. In fact, what Harold Ellis said, said that it enabled any fool to be a surgeon. I have just corrected it as anybody to be a surgeon. Because we as surgeons cannot call ourselves fools. Cutler Walpole. The Walpoles had been a, a, a group of a, a family members in London who made fortunes from doing practically nothing. The senior Walpole used to cut the viola for 200 guineas at the time and paint the viola every day with an antiseptic, taking 20 guineas. So he made a fortune. Whereas Cutler Walpole was doing something what is called removing the nuciform sac, which he claimed that could cure anything from toothache to tuberculosis. People did believe it. And just like the, the Arbuthnot or Lane, this man also made fortune. <coughs> he made his fortune from remo removing the nuciform sac from the fashionable in London. Uh, we all know about the Harley Street in London. And uh, how, uh, if somebody asked Carter Walpole, <coughs> did you have a nuciform sac removed? For which he said, I am the, one of the lucky and the unusual people who was born without it. He never wanted to have test on himself. But these were exposed by this great person, Bernard Shaw. 
he created a drama called Doctor's Dilemma, where most of these surgeons were exposed by characters. Walpole was there. So many characters were brought into that drama. And he was, in a way, responsible for stopping many of these atrocious surgeries, which we call now atrocious, but perhaps was the most fashionable surgeries of this day. Talking about Bernard Shaw, Bernard Shaw, we must be wondering how he is so close to the medical field. He was one of the one of the person who frequently visited visited St. Mary's Hospital and the microbiologist, uh, uh, the senior microbiologist there. And he was so 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 close to it that he in fact wrote an article, educate or oh, sorry, stimulate the phagocytes. There was an article by Bernard Shaw talking about this, which was later re or uh, corrected by Professor Harold Ellis as educate the phagocytes in one of the BJS in 1988 or so, if I remember correctly. The microbiologist's name was Amroth Wright. His student was Alexander Fleming, for that matter. Talking about some of the surgeries that has gone into oblivion. Uh, this is a situation of hemicorporectomy. You can't imagine being doing these things these days. It's a translumbar amputation for pelvic malignancies. A patient lying with a two stoma, one a medial condy and a, and a, a colostomy, which is perhaps unbelievable these days perhaps not done, because we have got a lot of newer methods. This is what they had to talk about, hemicorporectomy, it's a translumbar amputation, perhaps the most mutilating surgery one can imagine. It was treated for pelvic malignancy, it's a frozen, so-called frozen pelvis, which we later talked about anterior acceleration, posterior acceleration, and whatnot. It was first proposed in 1951, and perhaps few people were underwent this surgery. A series of 10 cases were reported from New York. Beyond that, I don't think anybody would have thought of doing, even, we, we, we are not even concerned in doing even a hindquart amputation these days. That's a picture of somebody who has had that dealing with his stoma. One thing which went down, as most of the senior faculty members sitting down here, was the treatment of duodenal also. As uh, Professor Shanai was telling, that you rub on the duodenum to make an appearance of <laughs> ulcer, duodenal ulcer, in the pre-endoscopy era. Uh, we had gone through probably all these sort of procedures, including a total gastrectomy in Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, of uh, relieving uh, the situation of peptic ulcer. In fact, I, I gave an oration on that the regrets and rewards of peptic ulcer surgery some time back, where we had more of regrets than rewards, to be very honest. But then later came the highly selective agotomy, which was proven to be perhaps the best acid producing procedure that we could consider. Though the, the zero ulcer recurrence was attributed to Megotomy and antrectomy, where there can be no source of acid stimulation whatsoever. But then this, this fell into disrepute over a time when we have got the pharmacologically engineered product came into the, in the treating daughter ulcers. Well, with that, if uh, whatever we have done. This is a very important topic to be thought about. Is surgery an anachronism in an evidence-based age? I'm sure uh, Sandosh gave a very good talk on what general surgery's future is all about in Kochi. It's a beautiful talk he talked about uh, how, where surgery is leading us to. Because more and more evidences are coming where you could probably treat people without surgical intervention. The big surgical procedures has been converted to small procedures. The big incisions have been converted to small. The big was beautiful a long time back. Now it's small and beautiful. Small is beautiful. Minimally invasive surgery is more attractive to the surgeon as well as to the patient. 
There was a, a, a very good uh, evidence-based uh, study done by one Indian regarding the peptic ulcer and uh, PP and peptic ulcer disease. In fact, he came to a conclusion that there was practically no difference in mortality whatsoever because of the complications. But it definitely reduced the surgical intervention in bleeding peptic ulcers. Yet, the complication when it comes, it goes to the basic principles. Whether it is laparoscope or otherwise, a perforated peptic ulcer, under, except under very strange situations, must will be operated and must be operated upon. The time old Graham's patch still continues to be the, the, the gold standard of treating a perforated peptic ulcer. Some of the things which have probably gone into oblivion is the radical mastectomy. People do say that it was buried along with William Halstead. A sympathectomy, a lumbar sympathectomy was one of the things which always we, as uh, in our era, perhaps one of the surgeries of, it, it requires a little bit of excellence in surgery to identify the lumbar sympathetic chain, to go retroperitoneally without damaging the peritoneum and not. Well, we don't see uh, an open sympathectomy these days. Give alone cervical dose of sympathectomy is one of the one of the best cervical dissection techniques that which you require. Whereas abdominal pedal resections are gone. Yes, we do do abdominal pedal resections in very, very ultra low tumors. People are trying to give a natural passage. I don't know at what cost, perhaps I, I'm not good at it to talk about now. Open hair hemorrhoidectomy. Very few people do an open hemorrhoidectomy these days. I just asked postgraduate students, have you heard about noble plication? Do we do, in fact, we ha I have not done, but then we read in textbooks that in recurrent intestinal obstruction, at least erase the intestinal loops and sew between so that it, chances of further adhesions and obstructions can be avoided. Where have open prostatectomy gone? for a benign prostatic hypertrophy. It's all been replaced by endoscopic procedures. Surgery for a variceal bleed. We were talking about tanners, splenectomy, devascularization procedures, gear and whatnot. Everything has been overtaken by endoscopic procedures. Similarly, it's intractable ascites. I asked one of the students, what is heliantectropy? I don't know what is heliantectropy. These were surgeries done in the past for treating intractable ascites. Talma Morrison's operation, packing the posterior mediastinum, a cross picuni button, or one of the, one, that time, I was also very much impressed about this procedure. Isolating a terminal area loop, opening it up, fixing it to the posterior abdominal wall, removing all the momentum to release, I mean, to cause adhesions hoping that the open dot mucosa will absorb the ascitic fluid. It sounded very good, but I don't know how far we have, we have not done. But these are things which have gone into oblivion. Very many surgical procedures have gone into oblivion with the advent of newer technology. No doubt that newer technologies are developing and is for the good and the, for the mankind, undoubtedly. Vasectomy, if you ask a, a present day urologist, to do a vasectomy, he'll be groping in the vas, in the scrotum, which I think the, the, the early generation have done by thousands. But what is more important, what the catching thing was, the post-vasectomy scenario, the, the bottom line that is written, it's all juice and no seeds. I hope you got it. <laughs> well, I would like to take a few, few minutes to talk about my teachers Having revisited the few surgeries, it is not an, an entire surgery that I have revisited. Professor Matthew Philip is perhaps one of the oldest living surgeons now in Kerala. A great teacher, a very meticulous surgeon, he was interested in proctology. He drapes the day, that region and stays back and says, oh, it's well draped. He, he loves to see that particular area well draped and well done. But it was a very, very good, meticulous surgeon, I would say. But what more important was his sense of humor. 
tremendous sense of humor. Well, I can tell you in private this sense of humor. Like that. But what I'm talking about is, uh, uh, is about his treatment of parenticulus he used to give us something called as vowel aphorism. These aphorisms are all probably outdated now. A, E, I, O, U is the, the, are the vowels. So he said that avoid appearance, avoid any matter, avoid interventions, avoid opiates and operations in case of paralyticalism. Don't try to whip a tired horse. That was his concept. You know, if you do any of these things or a kind combination, the best place is to take him to undertaker, where the patient is very likely to die. So that, see the ways of teaching, the method of teaching was very simple, very lucrative sort of uh, ideas that has been put across, very nice ideas. As my professor, he, he, uh, he was my mentor, Professor Vijay Nair. He always talks about intestinal obstruction. He never allows an intestinal obstruction. Uh, Dr. Shenai was talking about two cases of the situations. But he never allows an intestinal obstruction to go over 24 hours. Perhaps it was probably too early, but experience has shown us that it's better. Because what he always used to say, the sentences are very good. Procrastination and gangrene go hand in hand. The, the more you delay, the greater the chance of problems developing in the intestine. And he always say that your skull date the classical teaching is that you oscult it. I don't know how many how many surgeons carry a stethoscope and oscult it abdomen these days. The acute obstruction is like the tumult of the battlefield. Various sounds. If you can watch a war, if you can hear a war film from outside the theater, that's the tumult of the battlefield. And the paralyticalis has been classically described as the silence of the graveyard. Uh, these sentences keep keep uh, hitting me hard on the skull, perhaps the brains are little now, but then I keep remembering these ones very well, because that's why the gangrene takes place when, when you probably delay the surgery. So he used to say that auscultation of the abdomen is very vital, palpating the lower limb pulses. I tell you two incidences. A young boy was brought with abdominal pain and a new ear. As a houseman, I could find that his teaching was with me. I, I palpate all pulses, distant pulses were absent. As an intern, I was reluctant to tell my consultant, could it be a dissecting aneurysm, sir? He said, could be, I don't know, because there is aneurysm, it could be, we don't know, or it could be something else. But by afternoon, the patient died. So I persuaded the parents to get a limited autopsy if possible. Thankfully, they are great. And I found that I was right. It was a dissecting aneurysm. It was great glee for me, but a loss was loss. Another situation was one of my colleagues who came from the United States, being treated for back pain from, South, from California to Boston. <laughs> he has gone all places for his backache. And he came home saying that all I want is to have a good bowel evacuation. He brought me an x-ray which showed total ground loss appearance on the left side of the abdomen. I said, so, that, so and so, the same as Burley, of course, many people might know. I'm suspecting this. Next day, I asked him to come over to the hospital for a CT scan. He crashed at the gate of the hospital with a dissecting aneurysm which is ruptured. He died, he lost it. A gynecologist always used to say, a lady with the lower abdominal pain, no matter it's in the reproductive age group, don't worry about the social status, don't worry about the marital status, exclude ectopic gestation. Perhaps one would say that a constant observation of acute abdomen perhaps is more important. As I would always quote uh, our Sanal Kumar sir, a CAT, sc a, a, a CAT scan is not as good as an observation. Uh, many oldies might know about Professor G.K. Warrior. He was a professor of medicine. 
but a great intellectual, great intellectual and fantastic diagnostician. I don't know, without the evidence of, uh, without the, the help of CT scans, all these uh, newer gadgets, he used to locate things. I'm not saying that, why I say that neurosurgeons adore him, because his localization was so good at that point of time, they could go blindly in that area and remove the tumor or whatever be it. I still recall a situation where a patient with quadriplegia with a normocytic normochromic anemia. He said, there can be only one situation in this, and that is a plasmocytoma. I don't know how he said that. We opened out, found out that there was a solitary plasmocytoma in the cervical canal, and Professor John just removed it. He used to say that uncommon presentations of common diseases are perhaps more common than common presentation of uncommon diseases. It's a little complicated sentence, but uh, says one thing that always think of the common conditions first. So those were the great teachers. Professor Kalyan Raman was not my teacher. But when I was doing my neurosurgery training under Professor John, Dr. Kalyan Raman visited Calicut Medical College. So he said, okay, you come for rounds with me. Dr. John asked to ask his gentleman to conduct the rounds. So there was an irritable patient. At that point of time, with our limited knowledge, we could only say that probably it's a paraconoid hemorrhage or recovering from concussion. What is it, my dear boy? An irritable patient following head injury, please exclude a distended bladder. Please consider hypoglycemia. And please consider hyperthermia. Uh, it still echoes in my in me, and uh, even other day also I, I was asking them and my postgraduate students, would you ever think of it? We are more worried about the more structural damage, etc. So these are people who taught with simple ideas, which really etched in our in our brains. By and by, we know that knowledge advances, not by repeating the known facts. We will be stuck if we keep on repeating the known facts, but by refuting the false dogmas. It took closely 1,500 years to obviate this particular concept of Galen. Because Galen was, uh, I wouldn't say Galen, but then he was, uh, he was more considered of a great figure in the, in the pre-Renaissance history. Um, he said that uh, the, the, the liver was the organ which pumped the blood till William Howey, perhaps in 1628, found out that, that he, he set up the, the, the idea of blood circulation and the heart, etc. In fact, uh, modern medicine has uh, done quite a, quite, it, it has improved by leaps and bounds, no doubt about it. And we should take pride in the development of modern medicine. But are we, still, are we really seeing the darker side of the moon? We only see the brighter side of the moon. Why, you know, 59% of improvement in the West, we say the <coughs> developed country, is attributed to basic things, sanitation, nutrition, and control of communicative diseases. In fact, actually, less than 4% is attributed to the high-tech medicine of the present day. It may be too harsh on saying the war on cancer is anything but one. Perhaps for a great, for, I, I, I still believe that the old timers say that or cancer, we slash, we burn, or we poison. Do we have anything else other than that? We, say, we do surgery, we do radiotherapy, we do medicines, we give medications. As Paul Ehrlich has said that every medicine is a poison in disguise. So it's very important. The war of cancer is anything but one. We, we think that yes, uh, childhood leukemias perhaps we have, probably cure, 
But many NDCs we say that uh, we think that we have done a fantastic job, but we find that sometime, sometime on, on the, down the line we lose them. What about war, war on chronic illnesses, diabetes, chronic renal failure, <coughs> chronic liver failure? We now replace just like that the the present day car uh, mechanics. Something is lost to replace. Don't repair anymore. So, war on chronic diseases, according <coughs> to great pundits, is anything but started. But think of smallpox, is eradicated by a simple process of vaccination. It is not a high tech method, just a low tech method. I am not against high tech methods, I am not to propagating, uh, <laughs> not a flag bearer of uh, <laughs> low tech method either. But then, uh, as somebody was reading the Hutchinson's litany yesterday, yes, we have to, I think that has to go through us, time and again, time and again, time and again. Because Louis Pasteur said, little science take you away from the God, because you think that you have mastered everything, but more of it takes you to him. I don't know, probably, he probably said that, probably, you will kill him or you will die. The task facing medicine actually in our century, where we are living now, or the 20th century, it's, uh, it's expanding so fast that we will have to redefine its limits. Are we exceeding the limits in certain situations or are we falling short of it? Now, because its capacities are so much. So one process of thought-provoking thing is to think about, we'll have to redefine its limits even as it exceeds its capacities. Now what has better health provided in, in the developing countries? Geriatric population. So many other diseases and things which we never probably came across. Uh, we never saw Alzheimer's in, in our parents or grandparents. So better health care and longer life accompanied by greater medical anxieties. In fact, medicine has become a victim of its own success. Uh, I'm not giving uh, hardcore definitions like that, but then, perhaps, you know why? Because as we talked about uh, uh, wall poles, it's very easy to laugh at them, isn't it? It's very easy to laugh at our predecessors. I don't know. They will be laughing at us after some time. So these guys were doing TURP for prostate. Good Lord, they could have managed with modifying a gene or something like that. Why did they do such miserable things? So they will probably laugh at us after, after some time. So I would say that uh, let us not be dogmatic. Let us will be well informed. That's very important to everybody. I think we continue to learn till we die as long as we want to practice our, our profession. We have to continue to learn. Don't say that we have, I have finished my MS or fellowship. That's the end of it. No. We should be humble, as I told. Surgeons should be humble. As time and again, uh, we may be proven wrong. And you can't just pull up your car and say that I'm the best. Or that my method is the best and uh, work hard for the welfare of the mankind. I mean, this, I'm, I'm sure any old uh, people will be keeping on telling you, but this is coming from my heart. Because there's only one message that I have to put you across. Today's dogma is tomorrow's nonsense. It has been proven, isn't it? Whatever had been done in the past, people had been given goat's blood as part of transfusion. Till Carl Lundstein had found out the blood groups and so forth. So at that point of time, blood for blood was perhaps a concept. There was a concept, but then it went wrong. So this is a sole message uh, that I have to spread across. So don't be dogmatic, because today's dogma is going to be tomorrow's nonsense. Thank you very much. <coughs>